Hello everybody, I'm David and welcome to Removing the Veil. And this is my beautiful wife and partner, Sarah. And um, I'm going to kind of let, let her, you know, just tell a little bit about herself real quick. Yeah, so um, I pastor Third Way Church. I am a almost PhD student. I'm finishing up my last classes of my Master's of Theology at Fuller Seminary. And um, I guess that's pretty much it about me. Um, I am a advocate for biblical equality, gender equality, racial equality, social equality. Um, I've worked with many different groups and organizations. Um, and yeah, so I'm here now discussing this interesting topic with uh, David. So I hope that you guys will get something out of it, hopefully. And, I'll, and just to add one thing, she is an extreme pacifist. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I, I am working toward that more and more and more each time. Yeah, so it's essentially... That we're I interviewing desire. a pacifist. Yes. An interview with a pacifist. And it is for a reason. Um, uh, I'm starting a new series. I, I'm going to estimate six parts. You know, I could be wrong. It could be seven, depending. But um, the the name of the series is the Unknown Jesus, and I'm titling titling this uh, particular video the New Jesus. It is something that uh, it's new. But he's not new, you know, and because it's sadly the one that we seem to know more of. But this is an argument that Jesus is, was, and will remain pacifist. Uh, but there is a high debate against that, you know, that would be having a warrior, warmongering, war loving, blood shedding Jesus. And, uh, and we need to figure out where this is. So, so it's like since the beginning of his ministry, even to the death and to the resurrection, even after his ascension, Jesus has been misunderstood, mistranslated, misinterpreted, and even uh, misportrayed, you know, like mm -hmm. falsely portrayed by, you know, those during his time, even his own apostles, his own disciples, followers, um, you know, even, you know, even throughout history, you know, uh, we, you know, his existence, his reason of being, has been debated and even kind of dis, disoriented, you know, uh, throughout time. And, you know, so it, even his message, the whole reason of being, you know, seems you know, it has been changed, manipulated, you know, throughout time. So, and we could see this, um, you know, even as we speak today in our time, during the, in his home church, uh, I believe, wholeheartedly believe that Jesus has been distorted. You know, that we are not serving the Jesus of the Bible. You know, we are not serving Jesus of the Scripture, the one that walked with humanity. Uh, 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 Constantine, first of all, is a very popular one that has falsely portrayed Jesus. Uh, even the very image of Jesus, um, we can see through a, uh, a, a painting. Um, uh, he's portrayed as this Roman, royal Roman soldier ready to kill at any time uh, even to the point of made into the image of Constantine and then we've seen that throughout uh, even rulers of England uh, sir if you want to go ahead and just kind of like give a brief history of England and and the portrayal of Jesus throughout time yeah well not even just England but throughout all of history Jesus is you know, we've kind of made Jesus in our own own image rather than making our images after Jesus. And it's reflecting our own desires, mm -hmm. um, statuses, societal issues and culture onto Jesus and, and mm -hmm. molding Jesus to fit that. And so there are ways when that can be helpful, when we can see Jesus identifying with those who suffer, identifying with certain groups. But it's generally in modern history, especially Western history, has been more problematic than helpful yes. because Jesus has turned into somebody who is now concerned with state, with government, with right. um, these ideas of royalty and power and lordship. And so England is a perfect example, early England, where you have depictions of Jesus that are made to look like kings. Um, yeah. And there's this, this 
mixing together of the church and state that created just a very terrible, um, terrible history. I mean, we have crusades and things like that because of that union, and it was not a good union at all. It was a very unholy union, this idea of merging together the government yes. and, and the church when they should have always been separate entities. Yeah. And so Jesus being molded in that, we still see de depictions of that even today. So, mm -hmm. um, Great examples would be, I mean, these ideas of Jesus being portrayed as whatever nationality or nation as, as a soldier. And so the, the motive behind that generally is Jesus identifying with these people. But I think it's important that Jesus intentionally made sure that he didn't identify as a soldier or identify as somebody of power or authority or of, of war. And, um, that's something that I think we've forgotten a little bit, that the Jesus yeah. in the garden who disarms um, his, his apostles, his disciples, who says, do, you know, and even heals those that are persecuting him and really taking him to his death. We've forgotten that Jesus and replaced it with a Jesus that has brought back this eye for an eye mentality. Exactly. So as we can see, you know, America being the country that we are, mm -hmm. We have distorted Jesus with our Western version of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not a white Republican, white, you know, right-wing, gun-toting evangelical. Mm -hmm. um, he's not one who supports our political views or uh, political agendas. And I don't believe that Jesus even holds our capitalistic mm -hmm. views. Yeah. Uh, as much as we want to believe that he would, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as Scripture does uh, would. I believe wholeheartedly argue against everything that we have portrayed him to be today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the Jesus of the Bible would not be welcome, mm -hmm. and that's that's the that's the truth. Definitely. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and just read. Just bear with me for a second. I just read a few passages that would show this. In Matthew 26, starting with verse 50, we have, and Jesus said to him, "Friend, what do you have to come for?" Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached out, drew his sword, and struck the, sl uh, the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. And later on we know that Jesus ends up healing the slave's ear. Uh, we got Matthew 5. Uh, verse 39 through 44, and uh, we'll see where he says, But I say to you, do not resist him who is evil, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn him, to him the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you, take, up, uh, take your shirt, let him have your coat also. And whoever shall force you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Mm -hmm. you, know, says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your yeah. enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then we have um, John 18. Verse 35 through 36. Where Pilate, is, is Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you up to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting that I might not be delivered up to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So the things that we're getting here right now is that obviously Jesus is not fighting back. And he actually asks us not to do the same. You know, he, well, he, says, he asks us not to fight back as well. He asks us to do as he has done, not to fight, not to, to wage war against those who hate us, but to love those who hate us, to love our enemies. Uh, we see uh, Jesus saying that my kingdom is not of this world. So that means my kingdom is not a violent kingdom as you know yours to be. Your kingdom is violent. Your, your kingdom fights and defends. My kingdom does not do that. 
as we can see, if his kingdom was of this world, well, then it would be doing the things of this world, which is yeah. to be violent, to be uh, aggressive, and and taking lives of others. And then we see in uh, Luke chapter 6, bear with me for a second, verse 27, and it says, But I say to you, who here love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. That's verse 30, uh, 27 through 28. So we, we have this theme, and it continues on. And even in uh, Joshua chapter 5, and this is the last one that I'm going to read right now, starting with uh, verse 13, Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, rather in I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? So we have right now, this obviously is Jesus Christ, pre-incarnated, because he was, Joshua was allowed to worship him as God. And we see that uh, Jesus is saying, I am on neither side, not on yours or your enemies. I'm here just doing what is willed of me. And so we, we, we see that even pre-incarnated Jesus, the, the idealism is there, the message of, uh, peace, being a pacifist, not choosing anyone's side, not, not wanting to fight, not wanting to, to cause harm, but the, the idea of, of desiring to, to say, I'm just about the will of God, you know. And obviously him being God, his will is peace, his will is love, his will is, is pacifism. So the question remains that if Jesus is such a pacifist, what about the passage in Revelation 19, 11 through 21? And if you don't mind, Sarah, I would like for you to quickly read this for me because you are a amazing reader. Okay. So 11, this is, this is Revelation 19, 11 through 21. And I have my reasons for this. Okay. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful, and True, and in Righteousness. He judges and wages war, and his eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems, and he has a name written upon him, which no one knows except himself. And he's clothed in a white robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies, which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations, and he will rule with them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce, fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of King and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, Come assemble for the great supper of God in order that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and slaves and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat upon the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by who he deceived, those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who were worshipped worshipped his image, and those who were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So we have a very, very gruesome image of Jesus and this war. Now, of course, we all got to remember that Revelation is up for a lot of interpretation. Uh, it is a lot of symbolism and a lot of metaphoric language being, which technically the Bible itself, a lot of it is metaphoric, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and we can't forget that this, this is God speaking through 
the words of man, you know, trying to, you know, using words that we can relate with. But this is a pretty intense passage. Mm -hmm. So I love my wife's uh, uh, an interpretation of this. And so I'm going to go ahead and pass it to you. Okay. So um, we actually, we did have a conversation about this. And so with pacifism, this is kind of the biggest response that I get. Um, there are two. The biblical one is revelation. This idea that Jesus is coming back and God is going to just cast down the wicked. And the second is more of a moral question, which is, if your family were their lives were being threatened wouldn't you take the life of somebody else to protect your family and if not then you're not a good parent or daughter or spouse or any of that so those are the two really big arguments against pacifism from a biblical from a christian standpoint that our responsibility is to protect others um, and generally that doesn't go for our enemies that we're not respond morally responsible for protecting our enemies but for our family and then the second one is, is this passage here. And so it's important for us to understand that we need to filter any biblical text through the lens of Jesus. And I, I say this a lot when it comes to, say, issues of women in ministry or females speaking in the church, that Paul and Pauline literature must be interpreted through and submissive to Christ and to the gospel, to Jesus of the gospels. Um, and I think the same goes both for the Old Testament and for Revelation, because oftentimes we look at Revelation as it negates what happened in the gospels, and then the Old Testament as it negates the Jesus that we see in the New Testament. Um, but because we're, we see these as opposing forces, as contradictory texts, we generally allow one to take precedence over the other when it benefits us or our argument. So the, the God of the Old Testament is not counter to Jesus. Jesus is the representation of that God that has been misinterpreted through culture, through um, history, and through even our own understanding in our own Bible. And so um, I do want to recommend a book. It's called um, The Crucifixion of the Warrior God by Gregory Boyd. And in this text, he goes through all of this idea of this, this warrior God, this violent, angry God of the Old Testament. And how do you get that in Jesus? And he talks about how Jesus being this culmination of God, this true embodiment of what God is, that is the depiction of God. And everything else has to be redefined and reinterpreted in that sense. So this idea of Jesus being pacifist, Jesus being loving, Jesus being a peacemaker. Those are things that we know because we've seen Jesus do it in the Gospels. And so everything else that we see has to be interpreted in light of that, including this, this passage in Revelation. And so, like David mentioned earlier, this idea that Revelation is up for interpretation. Um, there's a lot that I find problematic, especially in evangelical interpretation of Revelation, mm. because it turns into this doomsday, apocalyptic, God, you know, apocalyptic yeah. God's going to destroy everything. And we get, you know, like the Left Behind series and raptures and all these things that are just yeah. really blown out of proportion. And so yeah. um, it's, I think perhaps, a disservice to the text because when when John is having this when it, when this is being written when Revelation is being written by John and this um, this this prophecy is given to him he believed that he was in Revelation he believed that those times were then he didn't believe that this was some future event thousands and thousands of years down the road even Paul believed he lived during those times that that the every generation you know, has yeah every generation has believed this is it this is the end yeah. and so. Um, Bringing it back to Paul's interpretation, uh, and back even to John as he's writing this, they were going through traumatic times. They were going through these these birth pains, as as they're talked about. They're they're seeing the persecution and the death of Christians, and and this is a reality other parts in the world. In the West, we have this idea that one day persecution is going to come. But if you go to Syria, um, where the church has really been annihilated, children have been beheaded in front of their parents they're believing that this is happening now, that the end times are now for them because that's what they're experiencing. So our interpretation of this idea of end times is is really in the eyes of the beholder. Mm -hmm. So when we look at Jesus and the portrayal of Jesus, we have to understand first and foremost that, that Revelation, the literature there should be, our response should not be seeking vengeance, should not be seeking this or that, but it should be worship unto God. Mm -hmm. And that's really what Revelations talks right. about as far as the believer, that our testimonies are the ones that we overcome by. You yes. know, 
it is, is the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimonies that are so important. So mm -hmm. um, those things are vital, I think, to our interpretation of this. And then perhaps making the, the text speak less about the murder and annihilation of people as it is systems. And that's the way that I look at it and I interpret yes. it. And this idea that Jesus is coming to destroy crooked systems. Jesus is coming to annihilate injustice. He's coming to destroy hatred and racism and sexism and oppression and violence and slavery and all of these things that bind us down, these chains that Jesus has always been preaching against. Mm -hmm. um, a perfect example is Jesus is always committed to not hurting people. But as far as being violent and breaking things, we see Jesus go into the temple and he no, destroys absolutely. the tables and whips some people and yeah, in, in this, nice spanking. yeah <laughs> it's displaying in this that there is a time and a place to destroy systems to destroy things to destroy temples even and bring those down because they're not of god these things are very anti-god and anti-human because they're destroying humanity they're breaking people down and yes. so i think when we see jesus of revelation we have to understand that that anger and that ferocity that Jesus is displaying in that text is towards these, these oppressive systems and these crooked things that hurt people. Absolutely. I agree. And that's something that I think we really need to see. And there's also something else that you've said one time that I really like. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, going back to the God of the, you know, God of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. let's go ahead and just put the quotation marks because that's what, you know, evangelicals would say. Yeah. You know, how he took life, but, but God is in charge of taking and giving mm -hmm. life, which yeah. is said in Deuteronomy 32, uh, 39. Mm -hmm. uh, God says, mm -hmm. I give life and mm -hmm. I take life. God yeah. is in charge of that, and it has always has been. Yeah. So if God is taking life, then, then God is not murdering, and it does not take away from the pacifistic yeah. uh um, mentality of God. Yeah, and too, I want to just kind of expound on that, that it's important that we understand that. We love God when God gives life, but we don't love God when God takes life. But there is this under, understanding, especially in ancient cultures, um, say Native American cultures, ancient Israelite cultures, that you and God together, really, God takes your life but it's not that it, God is killing you, but it's that God is bringing you towards God, you. right? And it's, it's a transformation, especially I think yeah. you see a lot in Native American cultures, this idea that, um, you know, there's some beautiful statements of Native Americans saying today is a great day to die and going off into the woods and just deciding with God, like, okay, this is my day to go. And it was this idea that we we're going to be transformed to something else. There's a transformational element. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very atheistic statement and Gnostic belief, this idea that death is it, right? The Sadducees believed this in the New Testament, that there was no resurrection, there was no life after death. But for those who believe in life after death, when somebody dies, it's, it's not to be mourned, but it's to be celebrated because they're going to be with God, right? Yeah. So to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so this idea that God struck people down in the Old Testament, I think we must um, reinterpret that through the lens of this idea that only God can do that and that be okay. Because when we take somebody else's life, we're sending them off. We're, yeah. we're, we're sending them to a different place. Well, but well, when also, God uh, ends somebody's yeah. life, yeah. he allows it to begin closer to God somewhere yeah. else. Yeah, well, to murder, to take someone's life is to usurp God's position. Uh, yes. And, and, and God's authority and that person's authority of their own life mm -hmm. uh, and we see throughout scripture where like Samson after the pillars fell he gave up the ghost mm -hmm. it, it doesn't say he died it says he gave up the ghost so he says okay God you know he could have lived if he chose to live that moment and God said yeah okay fine I'll, I'll let you live it's okay because mm -hmm. we see it with Hezekiah God yes. gives him permission okay I'll add some time to your life mm -hmm. Uh, we see it uh, with, with Stephen. Stephen gave up the ghost, but Paul experienced the exact same stone, stoning and did not die. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Jesus, when he was on the cross, he gave up the ghost. Yeah. Jesus could have lived longer if he wanted to, but it, it being the time that um, uh, the holiday was coming up, um, you know, he had to die at that moment. You know, it, it was to make things right. You know, for fall of prophecy and stuff like that. 
But, you know, so only God can give and take away life. And God does not have enemies. This idea that God has enemies is a very dualistic idea. And, and it gives God a, 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 a equal um, opponent. And God has no equal opponent, of course. So, and, and let's also look at the passage where it talks about that the word, I mean, that the, the sword came out of the mouth of Jesus, you know, in the book of Revelation. It says that a sword came from his mouth. But how many times was that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, mm -hmm. and in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the, the, the word of God, the message, the logos, mm -hmm. is also yeah. called the sword. So it's Jesus is bringing out the logos from his mouth. Mm -hmm. It is a, a, the, so, the source of the mm -hmm. sermon, the source of his message. So he's once again delivering that message that he delivered when he was on earth. You know, peace, be still. Uh, come on, it is, it's, I am your salvation. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I am that I am, and he's he's bringing this this mm -hmm. this this message that 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 I am uh, showing you my finished work, and I'm finishing it right here and right now. You know, but this idea of this other system, this mm -hmm. other Jesus that has been presented yeah. to us, and that we have presented to many others, you know, this counterfeit. Mm -hmm. That's the Antichrist system. Mm -hmm. I believe in my heart that that's the Antichrist system. That's the Antichrist system and the false prophet. John said that the Antichrist spirit it was there in his time. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, he said that in, in one of his letters, that the Antichrist is present with us today. Mm -hmm. So if the Antichrist is present then, and then we say that, that this Antichrist is coming in the future, mm -hmm. well, that would be contradictive. And too, it's, it's interesting to note that the early church had a difficult time discerning what that spirit was. Yes. And for them, it would have been much easier than for the Western church to see now because they were under persecution. Mm -hmm. So essentially it was do or die in the church. This idea that you would be persecuted and likely put to death for your beliefs. But in the West, that, that's not really faced as much. And I think a lot of the luxury in the Western um, world has led to a lack of persecution, which has led to really a more diluted form of Christianity where we can't, even more so than the early church, we can't tell what that is in the present church, mm -hmm. even more so in the Western church especially. Um, you know, if you were to go over to the Middle East or to areas in Asia where Christianity is illegal and you'll be persecuted for it, it's a lot easier to see what is truly of God and what is not of God. And so it's difficult for us to discern when everything's about what we like about God, what I want God to be like, or what yeah. I want God to say or think or feel. And it is a much more difficult belief system to believe in a pacifist God, to believe in a God that does not call for violence or the hurting of other people, right. um, especially when those people are our enemies, right? Because Jesus calls right. us to love our enemies. So, you know, some of the situations I had been given to critique my own pacifism, such as the ideas of, you know, if somebody comes into your church with a gun, are you going to shoot and kill them? And my response is always, no, I can't. Um, I'm committed to pacifism just as Jesus is committed to that, saying that we are not to harm somebody else. Mm -hmm. So it's this idea of having complete faith in God for protection and that being our only protection, that mm -hmm. I don't need a gun to protect me. I don't need, um, you know, to have any sort of martial arts or anything like that. Like I choose not to do those things because I choose to allow God to protect me. And this idea of pacifism being that I love my neighbor, even the gun wielding neighbor enough that I will not take his or her life yes. because that means as much to me. And that needs just as much protecting as my life. You know, my life does not mean more than theirs because they're wielding a gun and I'm not. And so I think a a, a commitment to pacifism is a commitment to our neighbor, to our brothers or sisters in Christ, to our enemy. It is a commitment that I am going to put you just as much as I am, right? My life doesn't matter more than yours. Oh, and like um, this idea of Jesus being presented, I think sometimes people just automatically assume, oh, my church doesn't do that, or that's not, you know, we don't have this radical understanding of who Jesus is. But I think it's a lot more subversive in churches than we realize, that it, it mm -hmm. does come across. Um, mm -hmm. A great example of this is, is the movie The Passion of the Christ. And I may make people upset with this, but Passion of the Christ is a very well-done film. It's an interesting film about the... Um, presentation of the crucifixion and the life of Jesus. And in this movie, 
automatically you get this us versus them mentality. So you get Jesus being beaten and crucified and it shows the Pharisees cheering him on and like, yeah, let's beat Jesus up. Let's crucify Jesus. And the pleasure that they get from that, it's intentionally designed to incite Anger. anger in us against them. It's intentionally created for us to look at, okay, we have Jesus whom we love, and then we have the Pharisees and the Jews whom we hate because they have become an enemy of Jesus. And it's, it's, it divides the line when in reality in scripture, Jesus did not look at the Pharisees as enemies. Yeah. Jesus did not look at the Pharisees as, as ones that we should overthrow or overtake because no. Jesus could have done that. Yeah. And Jesus even says in the text that, you know, O Jerusalem, speaking of the Pharisees, I long to gather you like a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you will not let me. So the entire time Jesus is condemning the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, he is still looking at the Pharisees saying, I wish I could love you, but you won't let me. And so it's important yeah. for us to understand that even depictions of Jesus that enable us to hate or distance or separate us and them is not a valid depiction of Jesus at all. Yeah, I like that. And, and it's very true. So what we need to realize is that with this image of, you know, God being the warrior God of the Old Testament and then Jesus being this peaceful, loving new God of the New Testament, they're both one and the same. Mm -hmm. uh, for like in John chapter 10, verse 30, he says, I and the Father are one. Mm -hmm. So we have that this is God. This is who God, this is, this is why I want you to see that I am. Mm -hmm. I'm not that person that you thought I, you know, mm -hmm. I was. Let me say, well, then why was God allowing them to make war and kill? Well, that God, that's the point. God was allowing. Mm -hmm. God was uh, letting this happen. And God was present with them and even helped them through it. But but doesn't mean that that God was the one that says you know I, I like this being done this is this yeah. is my my desire for for my creation to do well it's interesting you know? even in the book um, the crucifixion of the warrior God um, it is you know no no text is perfect but this certainly does address the issue very well and the mm -hmm. author poses the thought that God allowed these things to happen because God removed God's self from the situation so sin could destroy itself and evil could destroy itself. And so it's kind of an interesting concept, this idea that God removes God's hand so that it can be destroyed and then God can kind of pick up the pieces from that. And I even, and I even, even, even think uh, God's mentality has kind of shown what God thought about the whole idea of war. Mm -hmm. David being his, I mean, the apple of God's eye, mm -hmm. the, the beloved of God, um, does not allow David to build mm -hmm. the house of God because of his blood mm -hmm. on his hands. He says, you yeah. cannot build my house. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've killed too many people. Mm -hmm. So he says, but your son Solomon, who will be a peaceful king, mm -hmm. will, he can build mm -hmm. my house. Definitely. And which shows that God is not for bloodshed. God, mm -hmm. God would not allow dirty hands to build his house. Mm -hmm. No, you know, it, it just can't. And so what we are gathering from all this is that so... Jesus being this peacekeeping individual, this, this or peacemaking individual, shall I say, one that makes peace, you know, creates peace, uh, you know, is all about peace, uh, and loves the, you know, everyone has no hatred toward anybody, and does not want to shed anyone's blood, harm, cause any harm to anyone. If if that is the Jesus of you know the Bible, and if the and if that's going to be the same Jesus in the Book of Revelation, and the Book of Revelation is being maybe that passage in the Book of Revelation is being misinterpreted. How can we show that? Well, in Acts chapter one verse eleven, the angels tell those who are looking on as he ascends to heaven, saying, "Why are you looking? Why do you keep on looking at this Jesus who is being taken from you? Because understand that this is the same Jesus that's going to return to you one day." So that means the same Jesus with the same message, the same ideology, the, you know, the same mentality, thought process, the one that is taken up, isn't going to come back and say, oh, I take all that back and I'm going to kill everybody. The this, this, this same pacifist Jesus has to come back pacifist or something's wrong. You know, and that's what we got to understand. Uh, you know, so I hope that this helps out with, with that. And of course, this is going to lead on in, in, into more discussion. 
uh, and for future videos. But I hope that you really did enjoy this, and I really do appreciate you helping me out out with this. Um, you know, she she really is uh, a very knowledgeable on this aspect of especially of pacifism, you know, and inequality. Uh, she's definitely a mentor to me, helping me out with this as well because I struggled with this from the beginning. Um, uh, when, when, when we first met, and uh, you know, and in studying along with her, opening up my mind, it's really brought a lot of clarity. And um, and I did my own study. I didn't just you know take what she said and run with it. I, I did my own study. I did my own um, you know reading and praying and meditating upon this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it sure fits a lot better. It sure is more biblical to me than what I once thought prior to this so if you like this video please like and please subscribe to my channel uh, I really appreciate the, the, the support I'm not doing this because I want to be famous or because I want everyone to love what I say but the more likes the more subscribers the more people get to see this message the more it gets out there the more people get to be set free from their religious uh, box that has been placed on them and these uh, these prisons of man's expectations, you know, we want that broken. We want people free from that. We want, we want people to be seekers of God, seekers of perfect love, seekers of the great divine, you know, and, and learn to come together and unify and love one another as Jesus loves us. And that's what this is all about. So God bless you and thank you, and I love you all.